Hello viewers, my name is H.J. Oba and welcome to Claimnet TV. It is Afropolitics panel discussion today and we have an important guest in our midst this evening who will be taking us through this discussion. I'm going to be unveiling him soon. I also want to give room for my colleagues to introduce us. Franca, you can have the floor. Hello viewers, my name is Franca Lidemundia. I'm blessing. Hi, viewers. My name is Promise Ebuzeme. Okay. So you welcome, viewers. This is Klebna TV in Diaspora. Klebna TV is a platform that says to highlight Africans in Diaspora and our home. We are bearing to um, celebrate the achievements of Africans, both in Diaspora and our home. That's what we stand for. Today we have a political discussion that is around um, leadership, politics and election so and we have a distinguished guest in our midst today a well-known and political analyst activist by name professor pat Otomi. he's a political economy expert activist politician and businessman as well so um i'm going to give him an opportunity to introduce himself to the platform and the program and also to our viewers Professor Pat, you are welcome to the program. In your own terms, introduce yourself. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I usually like to introduce myself uh, in a very straightforward way. Uh, usually say my name is Pat Utomi and I'm a teacher. But I suspect that uh, some people may want to know a little more to put me in context, especially those may live outside of the country and uh, may not have encountered some of my my ways in the past um i'm essentially um an academic an entrepreneur and a social entrepreneur uh these days i'm also called a politician you know of all things uh, but very important activity politics uh, my um, background actually is fairly um, broad. I began with academic education in uh, mass communication, actually, then turned to policy, economics, business administration, and um, I attended universities in Nigeria. In the United States of America, I um, had two master's degrees and a PhD in different disciplines um, when I was 26 years old and was fortunate enough a year later to be named to a presidential advisory position under uh, President Shehu Shagari when Nigeria was still normal and things happened purely on merit. I knew nobody. I uh, had just returned to the country, and uh, I was particularly worried about um, uh, some policy areas, one of which was tax policy. I worried that we didn't pay taxes, which made it difficult to control government. Of my early, you know, government took his money from oil and did whatever I liked. We did not get bothered by government. We did whatever we liked. When I was growing up as a child, um, you know, we were chasing people around the place to pay tax. And so when you paid your tax, wanted to know what government did with that tax money. But by then, oil came and the military took okay, all the so oil money. Okay, let's go on a break. When we return, we'll be able to continue. Hello there. African movie? Search no further. Cleveland African Movies TV is here for you. We are dedicated to the acceleration of African films, TV series, documentaries, and lots more. Explore our movies at home or on the go. Cleveland Movies is free to watch on Cleveland.com. Don't miss this opportunity. Hurry now. Sign up and subscribe today. Uh, 
I don't know where you stop hearing me. I was saying that I, you know, uh, when I returned Nigeria in 1982, I was concerned about policy challenges. And one of those policy challenge areas was in the area of tax policy. So I began to write a series of columns in Nigerian newspapers about tax policy and what governments do uh, about it. And one day I just got a visit from somebody who said the vice president had been reading my uh, writings and wanted to discuss tax policy with me. Uh, two weeks later, I was appointed to replace one of my professors from the University of Nigeria at the government. That was Nigeria back in those days. It did not matter that I was 27 years old. It did not matter that I had no connection. Okay, sir. Thank you. Um, today, we'll actually be looking at the big tent approach to good governance in Nigeria. We know that Nigeria as a country has the issue of dodgy elections, corruption, and political violence. You name it. And um, Nigeria used to be um, a country that was economically buoyant before. When Nigerians travel out of the country in those days, they are traveling to study, not as economic migrants as you see today. But today, Nigeria is suffering from economic woes. And um, it's concerning, it's quite concerning, and we are asking questions. It is no longer a time to explain to Nigerians to say, this is what we're going to do to change the country. People really want action. The youth are taking the stage. They want revolution. They want to change the political space in Nigeria. Now, my question to you today, as someone we all know, I've been hearing about you for quite a long time. You've been on the stage. You've been on the vanguard of changing the political leadership in Nigeria. Now, you are spearheading, uh, you are one of the pioneers of the tent. And I mean to understand that the tent or the big tent is a coalition of political parties. Now, in your own view, to a layman out there, to ordinary Nigerian, what is the big tent? What is the big tent and what is it that they want to achieve objectively? Well, the journey to ensuring that we make Nigeria live up to the promise of its founding fathers um, has been one that many Nigerians have uh, averted their minds to for quite a number of years. The question is how do you make it happen? Um, in some ways, some of us were political activists from back on the graduate days in the very early 1970s. Um, and we began to see the shortcomings of military rule. We began to try to challenge military rule. But the imperative of stopping military rule came with the annulment of the elections of the 12th of June, uh, 1993. And um, I wrote a number of articles in newspapers uh, essentially saying that we must say never again. Uh, the first of the series was titled, We Must Say Never Again. I was actually in the United States attending a conference when the news of the annulment came. And I wrote that first piece that appeared in The Guardian from Boston. And um, that resulted in a lot of people saying, okay, how do we do it? How do we do it? And we then founded a group called the Concerned Professionals, which was really the nucleus of the fight against uh, military rule. And the politicians always tried to distort history, but what became known as NADECO was actually a creation of the Concerned Professionals. There was a group of senior 
statesmen who used to meet uh, under the leadership of um, uh, General Adeyinka Adebayo, former military governor of Western Region. That group was called KANU, Council of National Unity and Understanding. And the number of us in the concerned professionals then tried to stimulate them into becoming more or less a shadow opposition to the military during those dark days. Uh, we actually had some nominated ambassadors to that group. And they were led by people like Asue Igodalo, who is today's chairman of Sterling Bank, uh, Tola Mubolunri, uh, the late Tunda Akile. We are concerned professionals, uh, ambassadors to Kano, which literally helped transform it into what we know as NADECO. Um, that resistance brought military rule to an end. And if you read some of the books written about the fight against military rule, uh, um, one was titled Heroes of Democracy uh, by Yuri Bokwe. Uh, you will see the reference to the uh, contribution of uh, many to that struggle. When military rule ended with the Abdullah transition, um, the new politics, unfortunately, uh, the, most of the traditional politicians didn't quite think the military was ready to go. So they didn't engage. And what then happened was that five men of the military became the new political uh, players. And this group of people came in at the time when um, oil prices went from sing single units to triple digit from like nine dollars a, a barrel to 140 dollars a barrel um accountability was very very poor so many of these new politicians who became governors uh, essentially um, pocketed what was public resource and used the money to erect a barrier to end politics for the first time in Nigeria, his now really became completely about money, excluding thinkers, excluding the kind of people who could serve the people. State capital was complete. And uh, <coughs> the, the, the struggle, therefore, against that led to uh, the old concern professionals beginning to gather, gather again. So what was the approach? It was now much harder to enter those political parties. They had created two political parties. They were really two sides of the same coin. Um, that struggle eventually resulted in an issue which turned out to be just much, much worse than the people. And uh, attempt to then create a third force began, what was called a third force. And in that iteration, and the current iteration, uh, it will be came into the school. And for that passion, young people who were seeing complete demolition of their future by these rent champions that had captured the state within the APC and the PDP, and who had tried to protest social order with NSAC and ended up being brutally put down. Their decision to from the uh, streets of protest to the ballot box uh, gave better to this new initiative. So we thought that in regrouping, we should create, if you will, a platform that's not just a political party, but I will include people who don't want to join political parties, but are truly citizens who want to be counted in their country. That will include social movements, like the labor movement. That would include, um, if you will, uh, 
NGO. Include several other political parties that wanted to collaborate the way in Kenya that they forged forth to respond to a long period of dominance of the political space by one group. And the result is what we call the big tent. And the big tent, therefore, uh, has chosen to work with uh, the candidate of the Labour Party in a collegial relationship that can help transform Nigeria for good. Stop the slide, bring in politics that is really about rational conversations that is focused on issues rather than one big man versus another big man. Where the question is, which big man you like the more, which is what the central theme in recent Nigerian politics has really been. So this is what content is. I, I try to describe it as an organic bulb in which we have like onion bulb. You have so many people work together. Uh, if you have a, an organic bulb of complex redundancy, therefore you have several of these layers and each one of its own can probably get the job done. But you over layer in this complex redundancy, you can better achieve uh, uh assurance the goal that you want to liberate literally liberate the nigerian people from the kind oppressive governance <clears throat> driven by an obsessive narcissism a self-love where the politicians don't really 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 honestly care about the country so long as they can have personal power and use it to dispense favors to their friends and of course them so this is how the um concept of at uh, the big time uh, took uh, hold okay thank you professor um at this point i would like to give my colleague the opportunity to pose um a question to you and now with this uh, subject uh franca um you can go ahead it's all right, it's all right. thank you so much professor Over. Thank you so much, Professor Utomi. All right, my question is going to be uh, very short this time, and it's going to be is based on what you just explained. Also, about a few days ago, I haven't, even as a media person, heard anything about a big thing term theory or approach to good governance in the country. And you know that the election is just around the corner. In less than two months from now, we'll be having a presidential election in the country. Are there plans by the team to make sure that the masses are being carried along to be able to understand what this concept is all about. Uh, <clears throat> yes, the, the important thing is the activity of a big tent, not the, you know, uh, um, structure, I explain it in detail, the activity of touching people. I give you an example. Yesterday, we did something that I don't think Nigerian politics has witnessed for a long time. Uh, Candidate Peter Obi and myself walking side by side with dozens of professional men and women just walked more than 15 kilometers on the streets of Portacourt. People were coming out from their homes, standing on their, and we were, you know, we'll stop, talk to people. I mean, feeling the people, telling them we we'll feel their pain, we understand this is what we want to do, and just go in. That Typically, what they do is they fill a stadium who have been given 2,000 naira each and dance and do this and that and go away. So the policy of Nigeria has not been about issues. It has not been about the pain of the people and ideas about how to fix them. But we began to deal with these issues. i give you an example of uh, the, the day yesterday. Uh, we've started, as we did in the other stops on the campaign swing. We started early in the morning talking to young people in the town hall meeting, university students. We had like three, four hundred of them in the town hall meeting. One on one, you know, question, any question, no holds bad. We did that for like two hours. Then went into town and walked through the markets talking to people you know, buying oranges and eating as we were talking to them, 
and this huge crowd just followed us for miles. And then we went to traditional ruler. The, the, the traditional ruler's uh, uh, council chambers met just about all of them, major traditional rulers in River State. And again, it was one-on-one -on -one banter about what was wrong with Nigeria, what can be fixed, specific issues that, that affected River State, and the ideas about how to fix them. Spent some significant time with them, finished from there, headed to the stadium where the rally took place. Finished the rally, the usual song and dance thing, Peace squared, everybody. And we spoke again to the issues. Uh, and then finished that and went back to the street and walked another second of the record talking to the people. Um, I think that in the politics of what Americans would call the Ruth Garden politics, where the big man sits back and, uh, you know, just goes in and says 10 words at a grand rally and goes away, this would not have been possible. It takes a certain level of energy to work this program. And we did it all of yesterday. We did it the day before in Calabar. Same thing all day. Did it the day before that in Uyo. And it's going on as you and I speak in Yenegua. So um, it's a new kind of politics where the people have come to the center. Citizenship has come to matter. Previously, uh, this would not uh, uh, be the case. It would seem that Nigerian politics had become a uh, government of the people, had produced government of the politicians for politicians by politicians, as against the old Lincoln um, interpretation of democracy as government of the people for the people by the people. So this was uh, a game-changing paradigm uh, in Nigerian politics, and we hope it will change Nigeria for good, where citizens actually truly engage. And citizenship is the most important office in a democracy. I mean, I, I like to talk about citizenship and go and go all the way back to the old Greek view of the citizen, where you know there was a hierarchy of membership of society, now uh, where people in society think only of themselves, kind of, you know, self-love we see around here. And uh, those kinds of people are seen as idiots, not by way of insult or such, but that these are people who just think only of themselves. And when they move up and they begin to see bond relationship between them and people who have certain parochial affinity, maybe blood, maybe language, maybe religion, then those people advance to a new level uh, that are called tribesmen. But when these people break the barrier into recognizing a shared humanity and care about other people, when the death of one person far away diminishes you, that is citizenship. And the ultimate definition of Democracy in its intersection with modernity. Again, the German philosopher uh, that is often referred to as the philosopher of the public sphere, Jürgen Habermas, uh, will tell you that in that next book, it is about rational public conversation. And part of what we've tried to do with the big tent is to deploy several possibilities for rational public conversation. I'll give you an idea of the structure of the Big Tent and how it deals with all of this. There is within the structure of the Big Tent uh, what in some contexts would be called a shadow government, but we call it a policy review and future view team, where we have focal persons in all of the major subject areas of governing, education, um, health, oil and gas, power, and so on and so forth. These focal persons rely on input from deep dive chiefs. And deep dive chiefs 
are Nigerians with expertise in that area from anywhere in the world. Uh, if you look at the, the the person who's the shadow focal person for health, is a UK-based doctor, uh, Dr. Loretta Agboro Ogo. And I hope this man is a, 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 a brain surgeon in Abuja, but she uh, uh, is based in the UK, and she has a deep dive team that includes Nigerians of incredible uh, 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 giftings in medicine, in pharmacy, in uh, healthcare administration. And so, similar thing for power and for defense and so on and so forth. The, the, the deep dive team on defense includes what? 32 or so retired generals and some Nigerians like a woman who is in the police force in Atlanta. And, and so these, these very deeply thinking people uh, provide the basis of input for engagement with the focal person who is the um, shadow team. And that person can speak to raise the issues in public conversation on those matters and make it put to advice candidate Peter Roby in that regard. Um, so when we talk about structure, we have not just deep structures, which support groups and other political parties reach deep around the country, but we also have a ready-to-go government that has the know-how and know-why to transform the kind of very, very bad case we have. Government is almost bankrupt. Nigeria is on the brink. It's an existential challenge that we face. And so how do we manage to secure and unite this country? How do we manage to bring a new prosperity as we shift mindset from sharing the booty and consume to production? where we'll have a clear national strategy on industrialization because we must come back to industrialization. Have a power strategy that ensures that those who go to manufacturing will not be generating power. It's not part of their resources. These are the kinds of issues we call in the big tents and, and through several other uh, um, you know, uh, structures within Big Tent Arrangement, uh, prep Nigeria and get it ready to be able to overcome its current position, pole position, I like to say, in the misery index, the poverty capital of the world, and bring it into a country that, you know, knew and should continue to know prosperity. Really, it can make that kind of difference. Thank you so much. That's very explicit. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Can you see our question? We can shift to you. No, for now, for now, no question, please. Okay. Thank you, Pro. That's explicit. Uh, I would like to leave the floor for Promise before we go on a break. Promise, you can go ahead. Thank you, Professor Uba. And thank you, Prof. Um, as an author of a competition and, tra and strategy in Emerging economies, what role will, will you be playing in the government if Labour Party wins? And will you be if, uh, will you be taking any position in the government? Um, I was once uh, drilled uh, to never say never, uh, but my orientation right now is to ensure that uh, we take Nigeria back from these people. I would like to say, ideally, uh, uh, I would like to see much younger people than myself. I'm 66 years old. Uh, I should be uh, retiring to some backwoods somewhere and uh, enjoying the rest of my life. Uh, I'd like to see younger people coming to power. Look, I was 27 when I got to the levels that many 
40, 50 years old people are not thinking about today. Why should I be hanging around? Just because nothing has been done for years that we're trying to, you know, look at Professor Wole Shehinka at 90, literally, having to still march to make the country work. That's not right. You know, we should get young people taking these things over. I, you know, have been warned by my friends that if I said that I don't want, because it's my very honest, my preferred position, that I might be signaling to people that uh, uh, whatever skills I have may be denied the government. Absolutely not. Even if I don't take a formal position, I will always be there in an advisory role, trying to guide as an elder statesman. But really, ideally, it's my, my children who should be going to, to, to work, trying to fix things, not me. Thank you so much, Bob. Okay, at this point, we are still on um, Klevna TV in Afro politics panel discussion. And the topic today is the Big Ten approach to good governance in Nigeria. As we all know, the Nigeria is going through a political crisis. There is political tension in Nigeria, civil unrest, human acts of terrorism, and what have you. Something that has not happened since the session of Nigeria is happening today, and there is need for us to address this negative direction. That's why we have Professor Tommy on board today. As we return from break, we'll continue this discussion. Thank you. Clevenard in Diaspora Television is an internet online TV service. What sets us apart is a unique combination of hit African content, first and exclusive international free movies, series, music, news, events, documentaries, tourism, teleshopping shows, youth TV programs, and live interviews. Clevenard Diaspora Television is available throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and to the diaspora markets worldwide. Take your entertainment with you wherever you go. Watch on your smartphone, tablet, laptop, smart TV, depending on your device. Watch free movies with Clevenard Movies Television. Stop searching for free movies websites and watch Clevenard Movies Television. Watch your favorite African shows anywhere at any time. Don't forget to check out our top five TV channels created to get you informed. TV1, Clevenard in Diaspora Television. TV2, Clevenard Youth Television. TV3, Clevenard Movies Television. TV4, Clevenard Teleshopping Television. TV5, Clevenard Tourism Television. To start watching, sign up at www.clevenard.com and follow the easy steps. Once you're done, log in to the Clevenard website or app on your device, click on any one of our five TV channels, and hit play. We will be very satisfied and happy to welcome you to our team as one of our new business partners. Contact info at clevenard.com plus 34 631 279811 website www.clevenard.com Hello viewers, welcome back to the program. It's still Clement TV. And today we are having a political discussion on Afro politics panel discussion. And the theme is the big tent approach to good governance in Nigeria. We have a special guest on the panel today. My name is Professor Pats Odina. Okay, then I achieve a tummy. <laughs> yeah, welcome, Professor. So at this point, Professor, I would like to ask you, because now I understood that the Big Tent Coalition is geared towards enhancing the functioning of democratic institutions in order to restore legitimacy to government. Now, how do you intend to achieve this feat? Looking at the the functional state of institutions in Nigeria, and your focus from what you said seems to be on non-state actors. Now, how do you incorporate this movement into the sphere of state actors to really make it work? Yes, well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> you 
it is non-state actors we're talking about, but that's how institutions evolve. Uh, let me uh, clarify here. Uh, first and foremost, legitimacy is a fundamental aspect of how you govern. It's about connecting to the people. It's about the people believing that this is about them and for them, and therefore making themselves disposed to cooperate to achieving the shared goals. Um, one of the most, of course, interesting conversations on the subject of legitimacy was offered by the American political scientist Simon Martin Lipset 30 years ago in talking about the first new nation. And this is a very powerful and important concept. But what has strengthened uh, legitimacy and our understanding of it has come from work that has generally been done with institutions. How do institutions come about? Again, pardon me for being the academic that I am, I will return to, in my view, some of the best writing on institutions, uh, which was offered by Douglas North, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work, of course. And, and uh, I had the privilege of um, meeting Dougie North when uh, he was on sabbatical at the Hoover Institution <clears throat> at Stanford in 1996. That was when I was at the Harvard Business School writing the book, Managing Uncertainty, Computational Strategy in Emerging uh, Economies. I'd been invited to um, speak at, at, at the Hoover Institution by Larry Diamond. And uh, Dougie North was there and enjoyed an interesting conversation with him. Um, his clear thinking about institutions essentially make the point that institutions evolve. They evolve from the behavior of interested parties. And so today, it is civil society. It is that collaboration of civil society that ultimately leads to an agreement about a level playing field and about boundaries. And that's really what institutions are. Uh, it's interesting that uh, some of the most remarkable historians of our time have come to certain conclusions, certain paradigm is in place that institutions are very critical for human progress. Um, the British historian Neil Ferguson, um, in looking at civilization, the West of the rest, or in the subsequent title of that book, the six killer apps of Western power essentially makes the point that what separated, say, China uh, uh, from the rise of the West was that their institutional throws a couple of hundreds of years ago, uh, a couple of hundred years ago. And Western institutions developed and literally became the killer apps that made the West rich and strong. I in the main, I agree with those theses about how societies grow strong. Uh, in my own work, in a, a subsequent book that I wrote, Why Nations Are Poor, I try to make the point that besides strong institutions, values shape human progress. And the, if you really want to understand how societies make progress, you've got to understand values and their values. How did the work ethic crystallize? And how people, for example, deal with that. How did integrity and honesty and accountability, those are values, how did they crystallize and how do they make a society strong? So my critical sets of variables to measure society's progress is you look at the uh, choices, political policy choices they make, look at the strength of their institutions, look at their human capital quality, Look at entrepreneurship in the society, and you look at the values that hold all of this together. And most importantly, you look at leadership, because what leaders do is set the tone of culture, and that shapes human progress. So you've got to be able to really understand the values of a society, the institutions of a society, and leadership in the society to understand how a society makes progress. What has unfortunately happened to Nigeria in the last 30 years or so is that there has been a collapse of culture. Our values have gone south. Our institutions have become very weak. Very importantly, 
uh, our pilot human capital is increasingly outside of Nigeria. It exists, but outside of Nigeria, in the diaspora. And so our society is laggard. It is not performing. Policy choice has been here, there, yonder, you know. So if we can, through the work we do in the big tent, create a consciousness about these reasons why societies fail and rebuild our value system, strengthen our institutions from the work that the civil society does, manage to get entrepreneurship going away through the kind of policy that Peter Ruby is propagating of moving from consumption to production, where we can have this clear strategy, for example, that will take our latent comparative advantage as a society. Look at the factor endowments of every part of Nigeria and construct value chains on those factor endowments into global value chains. Every part of Nigeria will so prosper that nobody will remember oil and where and what not. But it is because we do not have a clear strategy that enables us to produce in value chains that are sustainable from every part of Nigeria, which is endowed, that we are in the mess we are of being the poorest country on the planet. Literally. It's all right. Um, Franka, do you have anything? <laughs> yeah, uh, I have a question. Okay. Uh, Professor, it is on record that you are the founder of the Center for um, Value in Leadership in the country. Okay? Now, my question is this. How possible is it to implement okay, valid leadership in the country? And then what is the role of the grassroots in doing this? It is through education of people that they come to realize the benefits of being value-driven. To give a very simple example, which I actually raised when um, uh, Mr. Fidobi turned to me at uh, the, the, the uh, town hall meeting with uh, students in Portacourt yesterday. And uh, they said, oh, okay, here is the man who founded the Center for Values in Leadership. Uh, maybe he can speak to us about this. And I said, look, look, if you take the way we are in the country, you know, in government of Nigeria, they sell jobs. You want a job in cop stops where they can steal a lot of money or immigration or those kind of places. You pay a certain amount, 1.5 million. I was there with a former minister, senator, and she said a relative of hers paid 1.5 million to get a job in the customs. <coughs> you have this in incompetent, unqualified person who is in that position because they could bribe somebody. It seems like an easy thing. He has got a job. He doesn't have the skill, doesn't have the character, the, the attitude for that job. The way that he or she will do that job can be the reason that foreign investors don't enter the country. Can be the reason that even Nigerians who have money are unable to invest because of their values, because everything is bribe and all of that. And then we manage to democratize poverty. Everybody becomes poor. And then we are wondering, where did this come from? And we can't relate it to that act of getting the bribe to appoint this man, the customs official, who behaves in a way that makes investors just run away from the country. When I talk about what's wrong with Nigeria, I often make the point that one of the biggest risks of doing business in Nigeria is regulatory risk. The central bank is more likely to be reading that you fail as a business than something that uh, uh, you have done or the market has done to you. And so to correct all of this, you have to understand the linkages and say, look, if I act right, if I treat a simple uh, uh, story here, in 1984, I arrived Harare in Zimbabwe. It's funny because I had to fly to London to fly to Harare for two reasons. That time General Buhari was in power in Nigeria and to hold foreign exchange was a crime. To hold a pound, a dollar, was a crime in Nigeria. 
So to be able to go to Zimbabwe, you had to fly to London to go and get money to go to Zimbabwe. So I, anyway, I got to Zimbabwe. The poor immigration officer who was there saw my green passport. Said, oh, Nigeria. Thank you for coming to spend those your petrol dollars in our country. We welcome you warmly. That was an immigration official, 1984. Oh, like 80 years or so ago. Um, I went to speak to consultants or, or partners of um, one of the big four consulting firms who were having a retreat in Victoria Falls in Zambia. And so um, we tried to walk around the other side to look, have a better view of the, uh, of the uh, falls. And it, it involved having to enter Zimbabwe to look at it from that side, that, rather than the that Zambian side. And they were, were asking for a bribe to be able to do that. Zimbabwe had gone from 1984 to where it is and gone from being a prosperous country in to being a very poor country when I, this happened about seven or so years ago. There is a direct relationship. A lot of people can be educated to see a relationship between their values and progress. We are going to be in serious. So as we go out, having the town hall meetings, that's why we be, you know, called on me to speak about it to those young students, not young, the undergraduates. One of who, by the way, was in his eighth year of a five-year degree. And he was not graduating yet because of strikes, the nature of the system, and all of that. Trying to get those kinds of people to think differently will involve a lot of proselytization and getting them to connect. Then you move into rural areas. Five people live in rural areas doesn't mean that they're stupid. That's where values were the strongest originally. You know, uh, part of, I mean, I don't know if I should be revealing this, part of the strategy that we're looking at for housing it involves returning to traditional ways of thinking about housing provision in your village 100 years ago, 80 years ago. How was housing provided? This young man comes of age and all his age mates come together and in one serious day of activity, they put up a hut for him. He moved into his own hut, which is community provided. Today, most of us are homeless in Nigeria. What can we learn from that new strategy and bring into mass housing provision? That's part of what the Big Tent is working on. And the shadow team, every meeting, gets presentations by its focal persons on certain areas. Uh, the presentation on housing, we've done general infrastructure, a lot of housing is coming up next week. But I engage the focal persons one-on-one -on, -one on the development of those ideas and how they fit into the manifesto that the manifesto committee of the Big Tent uh, has provided for the Peter B uh, uh, campaign. And we the one of next week that we're going to be digesting will include this conversation on housing and low-cost housing produced in a way that you'll get labor for house. But it is a concept that will unfold very soon. Well, that is very explicit. Thank you very much. And at this point, uh, promise, do you have any question before we go on bread? Yes, I do. Um, Prof, as a seasoned um, political economics that you have, what key points agenda will you be proposing for the incoming government? Well, uh, the um, candidate himself, uh, Mr. Peter Obi, has uh, been hammering away at something which I've talked about for many years. Um, I, when I say it, I usually say go from sharing. He prefers to from sharing and consuming to producing. Let me give you a simple idea. If you look at Nigeria, there are things, endowments, as economists call them, that we have all over the country. You come to the um, middle belt, 
sesame seeds grow in the wild. They used to make they used to make soup. One of the nice soup from from Benue State is made from sesame seed. But that is gold money. If you then tweak the curriculum of primary and secondary education in that area to focus on productive value of the sesame seed. By the time a young person who grows up in North Central is 13, 14, is finishing JS or whatever, he or she literally knows the best way to get the best yield from cultivating sesame seed. Can run plantations of sesame seed. By the time he's finishing secondary school, the value chain of sesame seed, from how you cultivate it, clean it, process it, and have it on the McDonald's hamburger bun. By the time he's graduating from university, he has marketing skills that enables him to be the one who plays the role in selling it, just target one European country, all the McDonald's outlets, supplier, of those sesame seeds for those bonds. Sesame seed can easily become much richer than the oil-rich states. Sorry, Benway can become much richer than oil seed states, uh, 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 oil states just from sesame seed. You go to Togoto, you take Gomarab, you take um, um, what's this um, that I enjoy, the Arabs eat it a lot, um, um, oh yeah, uh, adult moment. The um, this um, date, take dates, uh, and you can get oil, the fruit, the diseases from date, uh, from dates. You can actually from uh, between um, uh, um, what was the other? Uh, you can do industrial chemicals out of those and do an industrial park. Focus on industrial chemicals coming out of just agric products in that so-called, quote-unquote, semi-arid part of our country. You will find that Sokoto can be wealthier than Lagos State, just focusing on those endowments and building the global value chains off of them. But because we've not had really smart leadership in our country, because we have tended to focus on what can we share, what can we, and the big man is consuming as a government official who is creating no value so much. Just think of what public officials do to our country, the waste. There was one, one young man in the, who was crying literally, in the town hall meeting in Portacourt, he said he had to move out of the country because he couldn't even get to university. He went to school in Abu Dhabi or so or UAE. And he's in the oil industry working there now. And he said he ran into Melik Kiari at uh, an oil exhibition. And he said to him, What the hell do you think you're doing? Look at your exhibition. You, you add no value, you create nothing. Go and look at what the Saudis are doing. Their stand is over there. You know? But he said Melek Yari came with a delegation of, uh, he, he couldn't mention the number of people that he came to that, to showcase nothing. Compared to how many people came from Saudi Arabia, Aramco, that had all these, you know, they, they had the capacity to monitor every oil flowing through their pipelines at every point in time. And we, we're talking about oil still in Nigeria, uh, Nigeria. So, you know, you see the possibilities that can come when we really Take managing our country seriously. But the problem is that what has happened to us is that it's those who are the least capable who have been in charge of Nigeria making the decisions. And because they don't know enough, they think government is about traveling on government account and uh, uh, making all this cheap money they make, which they think is a lot of money. But a person who knows is driven by legacy. How will they remember me? By the values of how well I ran my organization, not how many dollars 
were found in my account. Unfortunately, the reverse has been a contemporary experience where I don't know how they get the, I don't know, I, don't know, but I shouldn't call it courage. But one man goes, takes billions and billions from state treasury and just walks away, just like that. It is because they don't have the appropriate character for the kind of positions that they hold. And that is the cause. So we are hoping that part of what we do in the Big Ten is change that trust of policy, uh, of the way we are. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you, Professor. The issue of Nigeria is um, is a critical one. We know Nigeria. Nigeria's issue is is like a Herculean uh, task. Uh, we will continue the discussion. We we'll have to go for a break. When we come back from break, we'll be wrapping up the discussion with some other patients we'll be posing to you. It's still after politics panel discussion on diaspora TV in and Clavenet TV in diaspora. So when we return, we'll continue the discussion. Thank you. Introducing Clevenard More Food. Clevenard More Food is an African-based startup and fastest growing food delivery player in Africa. At Clevenard More Food, we find solutions that redefine the food ordering and delivery space every single day. Order food from your favorite restaurants near you. Our aim is to transform the way people acquire what they eat and make food shopping easy for the general public. Help change the way people order food online and create a better and faster way to get it delivered to your doorstep. We invite every restaurant to sign up your restaurants to Clevenard More Food to enable you reach out to a larger customer base and increase your brand visibility. Download the best food delivery app now. Order from your favorite restaurants and track on the go. Download in three steps. App 1, Clevenard More Food is for customers who want to order food for delivery from our app. App 2 is for Clevenard Store Owner. This is for restaurants who want to register their menu onto the Clevenard More Food. App 3, for Clevenard Delivery Staff. This app is for our delivery partners. You know what? We are always looking for pickup and delivery partners who take exceptional pride in being a hunger savior. We find solutions that redefine the food ordering and delivery space every single day. Sign up now, buy, and we deliver to your doorstep promptly. Clevenard More Food. More sales, less stress. Contact, telephone, plus three four, 631-279811 Info at clevenard.com or clevenard2011 at gmail.com www.clevenard.net or www.clevenard.com Okay, welcome back to us. We still Afro politics a panel discussion on Clevenard TV in the Aspara Day. Topic today is Big Ted approach to good governance in Nigeria. I will come up on our panel today, Professor Pat Okedenaki Okami. Welcome back, um, Prof. At this point, we have an upcoming election in Nigeria. All eyes are on Nigeria. One of the most critical things everybody is talking about is the outcome of that election the credibility of the candidate. So everybody is expecting to see what is going to happen to Nigeria beyond February 2023. Now, my question to you is this. I know you must be concerned as we are also concerned. Do you believe in the credibility of INEC to deliver the 2023 election? You know, I, I like to make a point here about institutions that we talked about earlier. Institutions where Barack Obama, when he first came to Africa as president, his first speech was in Accra, Ghana. He said, Africa needs strong institutions, 
not strong men. And part of the challenge is that we keep expecting that what we call institutions will do right when we as interested people don't do the appropriate things to hold their feet to the fire. That's how institutions evolve. One of the things that will happen next year is that civil society, the political parties we represent, and the vast majority of thinking Nigerians will hold our next feet to the fire. But technology that enables us to be able to be one step ahead to make some of these games more difficult to be played. Fortunately, we have an electoral act that makes electronic transmission straight from the polling booth, avoiding the collation centers where most of the rigging used to be done. And we have a real problem in that the nature of the transactions involved in the traditional political parties like APC and PDP is such that people are driven to win at all costs and subvert the interest of the people. The nature of the transaction, the deal that are made, invariably makes even the best of people arriving in government unable to deliver on service to the people. And so uh, the imperative of ensuring that a new kind of politics evolves has driven us to where the Nigerian people are literally desperate to ensure that the games of the past are not played today. And so it's going to be uh, vigilance all the way. And the youth are so angry, the conditions are so rife that I think anybody who is in INEC and is smart will have to know that history is watching him. I, I was once asked this question on a TV interview and I reminded them of a, a historic um, if you will, similarity. When the um, German troops were beginning to pull back as the Allied forces advanced into Europe, um, Hitler wanted Paris leveled. The German general that was in, in command in Paris, a general called von Kulitz, and Hitler directly called General von Kulitz and ordered him to burn Paris. And for police, looked at himself, went and decked his uniform, looked at himself in the mirror, and said, why should history remember me as a man who destroyed the most beautiful city in the world? And he sent word to Allied forces to move in without resistance and take Paris. Of course, they thought he was setting a trap for them, so they didn't move. Hitler heard that Paris wasn't burning. <clears throat> Call from Kulis. And von Kulis said to him, is, is Paris burning? When he realized that von Kulis was not going to burn Paris, he sent another division to advance towards Paris to go and destroy it. Von Kulis sent a desperate message to the Allies moving. The message reached a certain French free forces leader called Charles de Gaulle. And de Gaulle led a ragtag French army and drove into Paris without resistance and took it. I said the people in INEC <clears throat> should look themselves in the mirror and ask themselves the question, why should we be the people that history remember as those who prevented the Nigerian people from their freedom? from their liberation, from taking their country back from a bunch of people. That's what the issue is in 2023. And I think some wisdom will go through our neck and the choices will be good, I think.
Thank you, bro. Okay, uh, Franca, over to you before we go. What do you have? Yeah, to and I have a... Uh, thank you so much. I have my last question. But also, me, thank you so much. And uh, my question is this. You are a household name in Nigeria, especially among the elites and, and all that. And so in 2022, when you showed interest in running for presidency, I'm so sure that many people were so much interested in you coming on board. But at the last minute, you stepped down for Peter Obi. Now, I, my question is, what makes that, why did you make such a choice? Or what features makes Peter Obi a better option for Nigeria? Well, you see, <clears throat> in politics, uh, it's what works for this moment that is important. Politics is the art of the possible. Uh, where I come from, there's a saying, I, I, I really make a joke of it, they said that if we pee together, we can build a foam. <laughs> and I used to, my joke is, what was the value of foam from pee? But anyway, it is still remarkably true that if we pee together, we can make foam bubble. I could very easily say, look, I created this base. I worked so hard through the years for this path that society looked away from. Why my moment? But I realized that even though I am well known, there is a stereotype of me as the academic intellectual idealist who goes for the ideal, and that a trader like Peter is more thought of as our uh, okay, you know, if he can come to our line. So I thought it was more important that I, I be older than him. Said to him, okay, my brother, come, let me give you cover. and Let's go and save the people. And that's basically what went through my head. And I said, let's go. So, so that, that's, that's a very simple logic of what happened. Is that right? Thank you so much. Come on, see, Professor. Well, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. That's... Um, that's a, a good one. That's to say, um, that's what we've been craving for, to have leaders in our society that possess empathy. To have the understanding that um, it's not a do or die affair. We can collectively change our nation and take it back from these uh, people that denied us um, freedom or liberty since the session of Nigeria. Okay, at this point, um, I would like Promise to pose her last question before we go. Promise, over to you. Thank you, Professor Mba. And thank you, Prof. Um, the last answer you gave was very interesting. I love it. Um, my last question is, um, you have been, um, you have been um, with um, the issue of network in Nigeria. Do you think, what effect do you think poor network would contribute in the 2023 election? And what solution are being put in place to ensure that people vote at the stipulated time? Sorry, what network? Because people have to be accredited, isn't it? Um, people have to be accredited before they can yeah. vote. So, yeah. Okay, well, you know, um, uh, we build, we grow. Um, ideally, we leave us. Uh, in really biometric, we should be able to vote from our bedroom. However, it will take growing into. So let's put ourselves through filing and being accredited for at least one last time. When we liberate our country, we'll ensure that technology will make it possible to vote. It doesn't make sense that I can stay here in my office and transfer a million naira from my account to another person. And I, I can't do that with a simple thing like putting. But as they say, gradual by gradual. Uh, let's stop ourselves through it, like uh, Jesus said, you know, so that, uh, you know, uh, the time of tomorrow will be better. Um, I think that what matters now is that people know that 
it is possible to defend their, their, their votes. It's happened before. I always give the example of Kano, when a simple civil servant was literally humiliated by the governor, and people asked him to run against the governor, and he said, me, civil servant, in Akudi, where is the money for me to use to run against this governor? And then he ran into a politician called Maita Masule, who said to him, Ah, Ibrahim, I hear you are a coward. And Brian said, ah, ah, my coward, sir. He says, they say that they are asking you to run for governor. You say, who are you to run against the government governor? So he picked up courage. The youth followed him. They followed the CBN materials as they arrived. They followed them to the police stations. They protected the votes. And he beat the incumbent governor by 400,000 votes. That was Chikarao against Kwankwaso 2007. The youth of Nigeria must know that the power to change this country is in their hands and they must liberate themselves. This World 2023 is about liberation time and it's in the hands of the youth of this country. Thank you so much, sir. That's beautiful. Thank you, Professor. It's been a wonderful time having you on this platform. Just your final word on this platform today. What advice are you going to give to Nigerian youths in view of 2023 presidential election? Uh, first of all, it is clear that the, that the new Nigeria is possible. It has been demonstrated that it is possible. And they, the youth, have played a very important role in showing that it is possible. But they must finish the race. They must finish the race by ensuring that they collect their PVCs. Those who have gone and registered must ensure they collect their PVCs. They must finish the race by ensuring that they convert their neighbors, their less educated uh, rural folk, to let them know that the moment of liberation is now. And they have to act by using those PVCs to cast the vote by a candidate who is committed to a new Nigeria. They must liberate themselves by ensuring that they release the vote on an election day and become part of a movement to change our values, to ensure that our institutions are stronger, to ensure that they better use the facilities of education to have the human capital to move our country from begging, sharing, to production, and truly prospering. This is the challenge of now, and it's in their hands to make it happen. And I've seen it happen. When I was living in the U.S., after my PhD in 1982, America had just come out of the Qatar era, where they were losing competitiveness against Japan. Jobs were being challenged. Inflation had gone to unheard of levels. When I returned to America many years, a few years later, the Reagan boisterousness, belief in America, had led the youth of America recognizing that they could rebuild their country. And the youth of America created a new economy, the dot-com revolution. So in those days, they were all attending, they were working on their CVs when, I was, when they were seniors and I was in grad school. By the time I came back a few years later, many of them were working on their business plans before their graduation and expecting to follow Bill Gates and others to become billionaires by their 26th birthday. That America is possible in Nigeria. The new Nigeria is truly possible. Let the youth of Nigeria hold up their flag and do it for themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. We really appreciate your time for having you on Clemna TV this evening. I will look forward to having you in the nearest future. Uh, viewers, we have our special guest today, Professor Pat Otome, on our platform. Professor Otome is a political economy expert, activist, 
politician and businessman, is also one of the pioneers of the Big Tents, the coalition of political parties in Nigeria, made up of professionals who are gearing towards changing the political landscape of Nigeria. So that's what we have today. It's been a wonderful time having you around. And I have my colleagues here, Promise, Ebu Zemi, and Idemu Dea Franca. Franca, what do you have to say? We're about to go. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor, for being our guest today. And yours, thank you so much for staying with us. See you next time. And Promise. Thank you, Prof, um, for the wonderful words you've shared to Nigerians and everyone all over Africa. And thank you for joining 7 at TV. Thank you. And for me, and, uh, but thank you, Prof, so much. We really appreciate you. And thank you, our viewers. We hope to return to you shortly. God bless all of you. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Bye.